Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Scott Everson is a limbic specialist and certified life coach. Decades have passed with Scott not feeling well, and seven long years since his health collapsed, and he became de de debilitated with chronic illnesses and symptoms. It started with antibiotics, circumstantial stress, and psychotropic drug injuries that cascaded into severe dysbiosis, leaky gut, nervous system dysregulation, mast cell activation syndrome, histamine intolerance, and many other symptoms that fall under the umbrella of these conditions. Scott's digestive system was an absolute wreck, and he could barely even handle the few foods that he was eating on a daily basis. Luckily, Scott has made significant improvements in his own health using the tools of a consistent brain retraining program, diet, and other lifestyle interventions. Whether you live with SIBO, IBS, pain conditions, chronic fatigue, long COVID, autoimmunity, or other chronic health issues, Scott's scientifically proven methods, unique tight-knit community, and a hands-on approach will assist you in getting back on the path to a new vibrant and healthy you. You can find Scott at www.wiredforhealing.com, and that is for the number four. Scott Everson, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me on, man. I appreciate it. It's such an honor to host you. You have such an interesting story, which we're definitely going to get into. Uh, we had a really good time before we recorded talking about um, the hockey playoffs that are going on at the time of this recording. My favorite time of year is Stanley Cup playoff season. It's been a really exciting one. Um, we don't need to talk about that on the show. Um, and like I said, we are going to get into your story. But I kind of want to skip ahead to a more recent um, event that happened. You just hosted Meat Stock. Uh, which I've had Serena Music come on and talk a little bit about. Can you tell us about that event and how things went? Yeah, so Meat Stock, uh, you know, basically, <laughs> I'd say one of the most healing things for a lot of people, including myself, is having community, right? And um, I really just wanted something to get the community together. And we got a few guest speakers on board, and that kind of snowballed into getting a whole bunch of guest speakers on board and, and some of the bigger names as well. And uh, so we just saw a lot of momentum going into this and it turned into a much bigger event than we had originally planned. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's it's going to be an ongoing thing. We actually have our next Meat Stock book for September 2025. And the idea is that we're going to have it as a retreat and convention at the same time. So we're going to have a number of speakers, uh, probably maybe 20 plus speakers, uh, and people will come in for a convention, almost kind of like something like Hack Your Health or KetoCon or whatever you want to call it now, uh, where people could come in, but also enjoy that retreat component to it. So actually living with the speakers under the same cabin where you get to live with them intimately and get to know, get to know them pretty well, learn from them uh, for, for five days. So I thought that was a really cool aspect to it. And, um, you know, I, I could tell you guys, or I could tell you that when I go away on these things, you know, and my, my health is still far from perfect, but when I go away on these things, I just feel infinitely better being surrounded by these people and being surrounded by community. And I've had so many people that have attended our retreats relay the same message to me. That when they go away and they're surrounded by people who put their arms around them and people who understand them and people they could actually connect with on, on more than just a surface level, you know, sort of, you know, I guess just uh, it's a very, you know, uh, what's what's the word for it? Uh, superficial type of relationship that it just it, it's such a healing uh you know, just time and place where everyone could get together and just, um, you know, just feel that sense of community that you can't really feel just being at home, like being here. Like I could tell you that I have my set of friends, but I keep this whole life separate from, from that set of friends. You know, they don't understand, they don't understand the whole carnivore thing and the health issues and all that stuff. And, it's just, it's, it's, it kind of sucks because it's not really something where you connect on a deeper level. So that's what this whole thing is really all about. And we want to really, uh, really sort of get the message out there on living ancestrally. So it's not just about the carnivore diet. You know, we get speakers to come in, uh, speak about circadian rhythm, um, you know, sleep, talk about, um, just getting back to your natural state through many different mechanisms. You know, we have Sally come in, talk about anti-nutrients and 
uh, grounding and, and all sorts of things, exercise, all sorts of things. So uh, it's really more of an ancestral um, theme rather than it being sort of strict carnivore. We, we're not really the food police here. So we we believe, you know, a lot. there's a lot of different diets that could work for different people. It's a very individual thing, but um, I myself am animal based, but I don't consider myself to be strict carnivore. So, so really that's what it's about. And uh, we're just hoping to keep this going every year. So it's a lot of fun. That's amazing. Yeah. So I'm about to head to the Hack Your Health conference in Austin. Yeah, me and too. It was my first one last year. Oh, nice. I'll see you there. That's great. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So last year and the years previous being branded kind of KetoCon, I understand it's kind of a, a the name keto is something they kind of want to move away from. And, and people have a lot of really mixed feelings about that. Um, and it was really fun. I had a great time last year and met a lot of people and you do get a sense of, you know, being around that type of energy with those people. But at the end of the day, it is a big conference room and, you know, people are busy and the speakers and whatever, like you get a little bit of time with some of your favorite people, but you're, your, you know, what you did with meat stock sounds so unique and different. And I think the key word that you used was like intimate, like you're really in tight quarters with some of these people. Is that what kind of sets your conference apart? I would say so. You know, it's a very different experience from something like Hack Your Health, right? I mean, Hack Your Health, I mean, if, if you're, you know, Hack Your Health is great because you do get more speakers so you could get different you know a, a variety of more perspectives on on different topics than say like we have to offer you know i think that's going to kind of shift as as we move on with this in the future but you know there are people waking up in the morning and, and going for a run with dr baker and then you know you're you're eating meals with these people you know you're sitting with them one-on-one -on -one. You're enjoying the sunset together, you know, like it's not it's that type of thing where it's like you really get to know them very personally uh, on a one on one basis. And uh, I, to me, that was almost scary. I mean, sometimes you, you kind of don't want to meet your heroes if, uh, if you call them a hero, whatever. But uh, uh, but these people were all amazing, like every every single person we had there um, just exceeded my expectations as to who they were as people. And they were all super helpful. They would sit one on one with people if you had questions and you had your health, you know, different health ailments or whatever. And they would, you know, put their arm around you and try to help you and and, and answer your questions just one on one. So it was a very different experience than, say, going to like a big conference type thing. Yeah, I love that. And it was kind of in the woods, as far as I understand, in Tennessee. So not really close to any major, major cities besides, I, I believe, Knoxville was kind of the nearest city. But even then, it was kind of out in nature much more than, again, like downtown Austin, correct? Yeah, it was uh, It was in the Pigeon Forge area. And um, so, you know, you got Dollywood and all that stuff. But yeah, it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere, pretty much. And uh, it was just nice, you know, just being you know, sort of one with nature while you're out there and, and, you know, doing some hiking and just enjoying the mountains. It's so beautiful out there. So. Yeah. The pictures I saw were lovely. All my friends out there enjoying nature and enjoying each other's company. Do you have a favorite story from any of the attendees who came, anybody maybe who had some trepidation or was there for with like severe healing or whatever, like any favorite stories that you have? <laughs> well, I, I have some story, you know, I have, what happens at meat stock stays at meat stock. You know, I, I do have some <laughs> funny stories, but I don't know. I don't want to piss anyone off because, you know, there was a few funny things. But, um, you know, I'd say that some people came in with a lot of reservation. They, they you know, some people came in not really even wanting to attend. But, you know, I, I truly believe that these things don't happen at random. You know, there's a reason why people came and. I think, you know, we we ask all of our guests to really think about why, what is the reason why you're here? You know, it, it's definitely not, you know, it's just, oh, I want to see Sean Baker or or I just want to hang out and eat some meat or, you know, enjoy a sunset or something like that. You know, there's always a deeper meaning for why the people are there. And I think the main reason for, I would say, virtually everybody is having connection, you know. It's again, it's it's one of those things where it's it's so healing. It's so amazing being around people who understand you, people who have uh, a certain level of, of awareness on things um, and people that that care about you, you know, um, which is something that, you know, I kind of am missing in my own life. You know, when I first moved to Florida, I really thought that 
I got my kids here at the time I was, I was married and I was dealing with really severe chronic health issues. And I thought I could just do this on my own. I don't need friends. You know, I have friends back in Toronto, whatever. And uh, I'm starting to learn that that's just not the case. You know, um, you, we are social creatures and, you know, by design, we are meant to be living in communes. We're not meant to be just sort of living on our computers, talking to people. And, you know, um, so having that community aspect is, I'd say, one of the most healing components to, um, to, to dealing with any sort of chronic illness. And if you don't have that, then, then it's just a huge uphill battle trying to heal from anything. So, yeah. That's such a good point. Your retreat sounds absolutely wonderful. And I love that you approach it that way. So hopefully I'll be able to attend sometime. It, like I said, it sounds amazing. I've heard wonderful stories from people like Serena Music and Michelle Hearn were both able to attend and both had great times. Um, okay, so we kind of got that out of the way. Let's go back to your own personal story, which is um, quite unique and at times very perplexing. Um, you've really gone through the ringer with a lot of these health issues. Can you explain um, how how this came to be, how how you started to come up against these health issues and, and what what you decided to do about them? Well, uh, you know, I've, I've dealt with certain health issues probably since about 2005. I took a long course of antibiotics and I've never quite been the same since. Um, I took, you know, Cipro 1000 for like over a month uh, for a misdiagnosed health condition, which they thought was a uh, an infection it ended up just being it was actually chronic pelvic pain syndrome um and that was due to you know plant anti-nutrients <laughs> um but uh but stuff you know i don't know if i could swear on this but shit really hit the fan uh in 2000 what is it 2016 um i was dealing with a lot of stress in my life and the stress led to working with a psychiatrist who prescribed me uh, prescribed me benzodiazepine. And uh, it also was prescribed due to nerve pain I was having as well. Um, and uh, when I tried getting off the benzodiazepine, uh, that forever changed my life. Um, so that's when the chronic illness really, really started uh, pretty terribly. And I have some theories around that. Um, I don't know if anyone, uh, you know, who, who listens to your channel deals with psychotropic drug injuries, but um, I think that uh, I probably already had pre-existing dysbiosis and gut issues leading up to that. And uh, the problem is when you take something like a benzodiazepine, um, they really disrupt your 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 mast cells, right? It's uh, they attach to mast cells. And when you withdraw them from your body, it's like your mast cells just go crazy and you develop this mast cell activation syndrome, um, which I think is, is really the root cause of leaky gut. But it's implicated in so many different disease conditions. I mean, mast cell activation, um, it's, it's kind of a symptom rather than a root cause. But if pretty much any, anyone with leaky gut could develop mast cell activation syndrome, uh, people who get long, long haul COVID, um, mass cell is, you know, implicated with mast cell activation syndrome, um, and, and really anything, any sort of gut conditions, inflammatory conditions, uh, it could be as simple as getting eczema, um, really most neurological conditions, anxiety, depression, uh, are due to, uh, uh, you know, mast cell activation syndrome and, and leaky gut. So, um, there's sort of this big cycle that I go through in terms of, um, how this develops and I've kind of for myself, you know, everyone's very individual, but I've kind of um, came up with a system as to how to help deal with leaky gut and stopping this whole snowball process dead in its tracks, because once it gets going, it's, it's almost impossible to heal from. It's such a difficult thing to come back from. And, uh, Anyways, I'm I'm getting a little bit off track, but yeah, it was it was mostly due to antibiotic stress and um and the psychotropic drug injuries. How prevalent are these issues? This isn't something that's very um well known or talked about very often. Is this a, a, a much bigger problem than people are aware of? It's huge. Yeah, it's it's massive. I would say the majority of the population 
don't have this issue, but it's estimated somewhere of about 10% of people who try to get off of these psychotropic drugs will develop some sort of uh, long-term withdrawal syndrome. Um, so it's, you know, if you think about how many people are on these psychotropic medications, uh, you know, to take 10% of that, I mean, it's a massive, massive population out there of people who are dealing with this. So yeah, it's, it's a big problem. I mean, pretty much everyone's on antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications these days. So yeah. Are doctors very well trained and aware of this as well? Oh God. No, <laughs> no, no, no. They're just it's they have zero training on this stuff zero i mean first off the the whole problem the f foundation of the problem lies in them prescribing it to begin with they have no idea what they're prescribing um and you know you you go into the doctor's office they'll take two minutes with you to listen to what you're dealing with and then make a prescription and they don't even try to get to the root of the problem they don't even try to understand you know how to how to deal with circumstantial stress teaching people the tools that they need to deal with anxiety and and stress and depression and they just prescribe you a medication and they have no idea what the medication is to begin with so it's uh it's a really broken medical system it's terrible i think the doctors have good intentions for the most part but they're living in this matrix like world where they're sort of dictated well the pharmaceutical companies you know give them this this sort of structure to to fall within and it's a very corrupt disease structure that's just based on monetary gain rather than actually helping people wow yeah the thought of two minutes with your doctor that might not quite be enough time that they would need to properly diagnose some severe disease I'm i'm wondering for you like going through this stuff again without like a, a great community to help you or without clear answers with healing and, and being prescribed things that arguably makes things a lot worse. Like how, how much did you feel like you were going nuts? Yeah, at first I did. Um, when I first, I actually cut the, uh, the drugs out cold Turkey, um, at first. And, um, I, I, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know. I didn't had never heard about this before. Um, I was, I had a seizure. Um, I was, I was very, very sick. I, I went to the emergency room and, um, they didn't know what was wrong with me. They couldn't find anything wrong with me. And, um, it kind of dawned on me that I'd stopped this medication a few days before. Um, I think I was in such a, just a, <laughs> just such a terrible state that I, I didn't even know what was going on. I, I didn't even know my name or anything pretty much most of the time, but somehow I was able to think, well, huh, I stopped this medication, this benzodiazepine a few days before, maybe that's it. So they, uh, I, I pretty much had to beg them for a benzodiazepine. They thought that I was a drug addict looking for a fix. And I had to beg them for hours to, to just give me one pill. So they gave me one pill and within about an hour, I went from feeling zero to 100 again. I felt like almost completely normal from literally on my deathbed, having a seizure and convulsing and, you know, just out of this, you know, living on planet Mars to feeling like pretty much a normal human being again. And at that point, I said to myself, well, I'm fucked. <laughs> and uh, I was looking through the groups and I'd seen so many people had, had gone through benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome which is really i believe just mass cell activation syndrome for years on end and it's just one of those things that people in the community don't understand that it is a, a a symptom of leaky gut it's not a brain injury it's actually more so a gut injury than it is a, a brain injury from these psychotropic drugs um, because they do uh, act so much on mast cells um, so that's something that i think is kind of proprietary knowledge in, in terms of what in terms of study that, that I that I've done on these drugs um, that very few people know about and that's uh, something that I'm I'm currently writing a book about um, because you know I think a, a huge problem in our community especially in the animal-based community is that the gut the gut takes blame for everything and I think that in in, in some cases like I just mentioned with benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome um, the gut does take a lot of the blame for that but i think what's lost on most people is that uh or i guess what's lost most people is that is the top-down approach uh, rather than just always taking that bottom-up approach 
right? You have to use your brain to heal your gut as well. The both both are very intricately connected. It's not it's not one of those things where you know you just work on your gut health and and everything gets better. Sometimes that is the only missing piece of the puzzle. But various times where I've found in our community is that when people start getting this back online and they get the gut uh, component working with the right nutrition, then that's when we see real shifts in people's uh, ability to heal. So that's really what uh, what our program at Wire for Healing is all about. Very cool. Um, at, at talking about leaky gut, uh, maybe it's not completely obvious to some of the listeners, like what the, what we know about the cause of it. I think everybody knows that it's on the rise and we're seeing more and more of it. But in your opinion, what causes leaky gut to begin with? Um, I would say the number, the most underrated root cause of leaky gut is stress, chronic stress. Um, and people are always looking for, you know, mold and uh, heavy metal toxicity and um, antibiotics and so on and so forth. And those could definitely be contributing factors. I would say something like mold and, and heavy metals, for instance, is more of a, is more of a, a, a symptom rather than a root cause. Um, I think that manifests when, especially when you do have leaky gut. Um, and same with like plant anti-nutrients, like if, if you're someone who deals with oxalates, I think really that again is something that, uh, is, is more of a symptom of leaky gut. Um, but something like antibiotics could definitely be root cause because it could lead to dysbiosis and more inflammation and then chronic stress because of the, uh, you know, in inflammatory nature of, of stress, right? You're releasing all these, um, inflammatory hormones constantly, uh, wears away the stomach lining. Uh, you develop dysbiosis, um, and your your stomach line could get worn away so much that you develop these uh, these gaps in the tight junction of your of your of your lining, right? So um, when when that happens, all hell breaks loose, and uh, and really any sort of disease or or symptoms could manifest from that. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. When, as you were doing research to try to get yourself out of this hole, when did it occur to you that nutrition was a big part of this, uh, specifically the nutrition piece? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think the body has a miraculous way of healing uh, as best it can without our interve in intervention. Um, some people might be a little bit too far gone that they might need to take a, a you know, make a dietary intervention and, and sometimes in a big way. Um, and that was in my case. Um, so um, I've had severe leaky gut and uh, mast cell activation syndrome, partially because I'm, I'm actually still currently on a psychotropic uh, medication that I'm having a very hard time getting off of. And that is a, it's an SNRI called Cymbalta. Um, and that plays huge implications in, in, um, slowing your transit time, slowing your motility down and worsening mast cell activation syndrome. So, but, um, but I think that for the most part, uh, with, with leaky gut and, and, and sort of, um, as I mentioned before, it's, it's really about trying to find the root cause of things. And I think that for the most part, everyone's trying to find a quick fix. People are always looking for something. You go to these practitioners and, you know, this is just my opinion. I'm just throwing this out there. Some people might get angry at me for saying this, but uh, practitioners will always try to find something that they make a prescription for, you know, some way to make money off of it. Mold is a very sexy thing because mold, uh, mold toxicity um, is very costly to treat. Um, and really i mean i do believe that you know people have serves and mold toxicities and stuff like that but i think that um there is no real testing to test for that virtually everybody who tests for mold toxicity tests as positive Jeez. um and then you'll have to go on this you know tens of thousands of dollars protocol to 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 help you with that and even then the chances of making a recovery from that protocol I would say are less than 50% from at least people wow. I've talked to. I mean, I don't have any real statistics. There's no studies on that, but I'm just saying anecdotally from people I've talked to. And the same goes for a lot of other conditions. What I'm all about is getting back to their natural state, right? Getting back to the natural state, um, cutting out all the crap foods. Everybody could agree that 
there's no place uh, in our in our dietary system for processed foods. Um, so cutting those out to begin with, see how you do with that. Let's reduce the stress. Let's reduce, you know, get away from this sort of modern lifestyle as much as we can and getting back to living naturally. And, uh, and then we make modifications from there. If you can't handle plants, then we, we go into the, the sort of perfect elimination diet, which is carnivore, um, which will really help with symptoms. It doesn't necessarily help fix leaky gut for a lot of people, but it'll help with symptoms. And, and sometimes just taking care of that component, reducing symptoms, stopping the inflammatory process can be conducive to healing completely. Um, and, you know, like I said, one thing that's really helped me for in my healing journey is just taking bits and pieces from a bunch of the experts out there and seeing what works for you. I think when you have a laser focus, like for myself, in terms of fixing the dysbiosis, okay, or um, just oxalates or mold or heavy metals or candida or SIBO or whatever it might be, when you have that laser focus, you're missing the bigger uh, puzzle. You're missing the bigger picture of the puzzle here. And I, what I've really done is I've taken bits and pieces from all the experts and seeing what applies to my situation. And you really have to, it can be very complicated, but very simple at the same time. I'm a big believer that, you know, the simpler you make your protocol, the better it is. Um, because it's it's all about getting back to homeostasis, getting back to a natural state. And a lot of times when you make your protocol more complicated, I've seen this time and time again, people actually get sicker. People get sicker. It, it's not a good idea to throw in all these supplements and stuff like that. When you're doing that, you're getting further away from our natural state. Interesting. And I know you mentioned that you have done a strict version of a carnivore diet and now consider yourself animal-based. For carnivore, um, I, I love the definition of a carnivore in nature being about 70 to 75% of caloric intake coming from animal foods. Do you believe that Carnivore was, again, not, not laser focused just on nutrition, but a piece of that puzzle because you were including some of the most healing foods and also eliminating some of the foods that were causing damage. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think carnivore is awesome for a lot of people. I mean, especially of like autoimmune conditions. Um, I've just seen the most remarkable things ever. I mean, carnivore can be healing in so many different cases. You know, um, if you have mental, uh, you know, if, if you have sort of mental issues, you know, dealing with anxiety, depression, um, you know, uh, even autism, <laughs> you know, there, I mean, it's just, there's so many different, you know, uh, health conditions where carnivore has sometimes completely resolved the case, which is, which, which is just absolutely amazing. You know, I think that when you, um, the great thing, I'd say the best thing about carnivore for a lot of people is, is that, it's sort of a gateway to discovering yourself and discovering so many things about the world. It's kind of like leaving the matrix a little bit, you know, um, you, you discover a lot about, you know, corruption, in the system, corruption, in the medical system, uh, and realizing that we are kind of living in this wild west of, of, you know, being able to, to, heal from me different medical conditions, right? That you can heal from the most, the craziest, ma you know, the, the craziest thing to me, Casey, are people that come to me with cancer. People that talk to me, they have, they have cancer. I had this one guy, he was eating uh, two steaks a day and uh, he was doing some fasting and he cured his cancer. And I've talked, it's not just one person. I mean, we had Dr. Seafried on. Um, I know I'm going on a ramp. I just want to list this as an example but I never would have discovered this had I not gone carnivore because it made me question things. It sparked something in me that now I question everything. And yeah, you could get too far into conspiracy theories and all this and all that. The earth is flat, whatever, you know, you can believe what you want, but now I question everything. Now I I'm reading about all these studies on how, um, you know, uh, metabolic therapy getting into, um, a deeper level of ketosis and glutamine inhibition uh, is is killing uh, cancer cells. 
and and people are making complete recoveries. And I've spoken to literally dozens of people now that are making complete recoveries, all natural, without radiation, chemo, all those toxic therapies, just through diet alone, which is insane to me. And that is that pertains to so many different health conditions out there. So I really think that carnivore is a great diet. I don't think it's needed for everybody. I'm not melting carnivore saying everybody should be carnivore. My kids are not carnivore. Um, I think you got to do what works for you. But if you're looking for the ultimate elimination diet, then carnivore can be amazing. However, for a lot of people, they need to really find different pieces of the, of the puzzle to actually heal. You know, sometimes carnivore just acts more as a, as a band-aid. It's not actually the, you know, the perfect healing mechanism that that is sort of pervade out there on the internet, you know, where people, everyone, everyone's healed of everything within two weeks. There's a huge subset of people where that's just not the case. And sometimes in some, in some cases, carnivore can make you worse. Um, so you really need to be able to navigate what's best for you and, and, you know, um, really listen to your own intuition rather than listening to what people are telling you. Yeah. I love that. That's very well explained. I know that ca the cancer in particular is a passion of yours. We've talked to Thomas, uh, Seyfried as well. He is an amazing human. The thing that stuck out at me the most last time we talked to him is when he said the phrase cancer is a revenue creating disease. I, I just like. Man, when you really think about the implications of that, I mean, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer at 37, 38, very young. She was gone by 46. Like, I'm sorry to hear that, man. It's just, I, and you, you look back and you say like, well, was it the cancer that was progressing or was it all of this chemo and all of this radiation? She had, like, she'd reached her limit of radiation that she could get in her lifetime. And like seeing these treatments and, and knowing that we were bringing her sugary drinks like jamba juices and, and the, the the caramel whatever apple drinks from starbucks during her treatments like to, yeah. to help like soothe her during her treatments like terrible stuff so i wonder if you could go into a little bit greater detail of what you mentioned toxic therapies for cancer again i know this is a passion of yours well so i just want to say i'm very sorry that you had to go through that and i i, I think it must be very hard, especially knowing what we know now um, and looking back on it, you know, uh, and, and I've had relatives die of cancer. And, and and that's it's such a feeling just to know that, man, if I only had known what I know now and if if maybe I could have potentially made them listen to me, then it, it could have changed everything. But, you know, you can't take a time machine, unfortunately. Um, but uh Dr. Seafried mentioned that, you know, I think more than 50% of people actually die from the complications of cancer, which basically just means that they die from the, the therapies involved through radiation or chemo. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's one of those things where unfortunately that this, there's such a, a massive revenue model, you know, with the hospitals and, and uh, pharmaceuticals that, I don't know. I, you know, I don't want to say it's conspiracy, but I think that I think that they really try to push down the any evidence to the contrary uh, in terms of they they do try to just not it's not like they're vilifying metabolic therapy per se, at least not from really what I've seen. But it's more so that they're just not giving any credibility to it, like they're not talking about it in any of the literature anywhere. Right. They're not they're not. It's not nothing that's ever mentioned anywhere in, in the medical community. You know, you have to look for alternative practitioners to know about this. And it's it's really sad. You know, we have some of the best researchers at Boston College and uh, Johns Hopkins who are researching this. And there's probably hundreds of published papers and case studies out there uh, with metabolic therapy and glutamine inhibition. And uh, they actually created this drug, Dawn. Uh, which is a glutamine in inhibitor, and they they obviously didn't get approved um, because of 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 uh, side effects. <laughs> well, well they, like how ridiculous is that? I mean, what are the side effects of chemo and radiation? Right, <laughs> Don wasn't killing anybody; it was just making people very sick. When you inhibit glutamine, you know it's really hard on the body, but people weren't dying from it. 
Well, there's plenty of people dying from radiation and chemo. I can tell you that. (laughs) So, uh, and not only that, but, you know, I've talked to so many people. It's like you do radiation and and you never come back from it. It it, it damages your immune system so much that oftentimes the the cancer comes back because your immune system is just tanked and people never recover from it. They never recover from it. Um, It destroys your, your gut microbiome, just destroys it. And that, that there's evidence of that. There's studies of that, that it, it completely changes your gut microbiome. Even if they're, you know, if you're doing radiation, you know, some people think, well, it's like, you know, if you're doing radiation on, on say your, your, uh, uh, I, I don't know, your neck or something like that, that, well, how's that going to affect your gut microbiome? Well, it actually does. It completely changes your gut flora. Right. So it's it's just one of those things, you know. If I had the 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 choice between those and 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 say metabolic therapy with glutamine inhibition, I I would definitely choose the natural route, and I I would die on that sword. I've I've thought about that many times, because I you know I'm I'm a pretty high candidate for for cancer risk, you know I I've had cancer run in my family. It's not like I've been the healthiest guy around over the course of my life. I've had a lot of inflammation, everything. So, um. So, yeah, I mean, it's just something I'm very interested in. I it's it it pains me that um, you know I go to the hospital, I go by these cancer wards, especially in the pediatric unit with all these kids, and it's just it's I I honestly I can't think of anything more depressing than that. It's it's so sad to look at. Yeah, it's pretty terrible. Well, again, we think back on that phrase that cancer is a revenue creating disease, and and you're right. Like I I don't want to push too much into like conspiracy theory but if you just think about it in in simple terms these are businesses they make money like what do you think they're going to do if people eat in a certain way or try to follow metabolic therapies for cancer including changing the diet or new drugs that help block glutamine like dr safery talks a lot about at least even like temporarily where is that revenue going to go like they're they're not collecting revenue when they do that and so it's just a simple question of business and it's too bad that more people can't um, I guess question that it's nice to know that you've already made your decision and that is the hill that you're going to die on. Um, I, I've also often asked like people in the, in the cancer field who study this kind of stuff, like what happens when the white coat is telling you that you have cancer, what, what are you going to do about it? And I think we're to a point where so many people, you're right. Like the studies are one thing, but I, I think the case studies are even more and more powerful and very prevalent of people out there that are doing really, really well with their cancer diagnoses by just if nothing else, just simply changing the diet or focusing on that. So I think that's very interesting. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, I, I, I think it, it's, again, it's just one of those things. It's just amazing to, to, to hear and see all this. I mean, a few years ago, I would have thought all this was complete quackery, but uh, when you deal with uh, chronic illness on your own and you're sort of lifted out of this matrix like world that's created for you, <laughs> You know, you start to become a lot more self-aware about things and self-aware of, of yourself as well. And um, I could tell you that, you know, what's amazing to me, and, and again, this is getting off topic, but I just kind of wanted to take it in this direction a little bit. And I apologize for doing that. But uh, the most amazing thing is that most people I've spoken to that live with cancer, chronic illness, any type of chronic illness, um, always has gratitude for having gone through that. Um, even if they haven't come out through the other side, I mean, I haven't come out through the other side of it, but, um, it's brought, it's been such a huge gift in my life to live with chronic illness and, uh, all the amazing things have come out of that. So I think that's been probably the most inspiring thing of, of talking to people in this community. Yeah. Well, that's a really good point. I'm glad you're taking the conversation in this direction. This is a really good segue. Let's talk about wired for healing. When, when did your kind of focus shift from, you know, worrying about yourself and trying to get yourself sorted out and on the path to healing everything that you were dealing with to then say like, wow, we really do need this community. I need, you need to be the one to kind of start it and get that going. What was that like? Well, it was, it was difficult because I was still extremely ill at the time. Um, and I just was basically doing it for kind of maybe more selfish reasons that I just wanted to have a community around and have people to to talk to and relate to you know um but you know as i as i got better i mean i i really developed a a huge interest in neuroplasticity training um and we started coaching a lot more in that 
uh, because I really believe that that's something that's missing out there. I really believe that the, the top down approach to healing is a huge missing component. You know, I, I really think that stress is one of the main root causes, if not the, the root cause for most chronic illness um, because of the, the whole uh, inflammatory process of, of dealing with chronic stress. You know, we live in a modern world now where everything is so unnatural. We don't even know what's natural anymore. And we think that it's just natural to live in this sort of chronically stressed state on a daily basis. And I think most people don't understand that chronically uh, living in that fight or flight state on a daily basis is so damaging to our health. You know, the stress out there of, of having to, you know, work jobs that we, you know, that, that we don't really like or feeling like you don't have purpose in your life is a huge stress for a lot of people. Um, all like the little daily things, living outside of nature, being inside our computers all day and, and stuff like that. They're huge stressors. And, um, you know, we, we do, we talk about brain retraining, but brain retraining is all about getting back to your natural state, right? It's all about homeostasis. It's about getting away from this sort of world of, of just, you know, chronic fight or flight, you know, uh, sympathetic nervous system activation and, um, you know, activating your parasympathetic state to allow your body to heal from chronic disease and and prevent chronic disease. So I can tell you right now that that's probably been the biggest game changer in terms of my own healing. And there's been a few other factors in there as well, like a few other sort of lifestyle modifications, diet and fasting and uh, work out my circadian rhythm and that kind of thing. So. Gotcha. Okay. As I think about the spectrum of my clients, the day-to-day -day people that I see, I do see that stress is a huge issue. It is tough and they do work jobs they don't like, and they do have families and, you know, it's, it's the kind of world now where both, if, if people are together, um, you know, as, as, as spouses, they, they both have to work jobs. Um, and, and so practically speaking, as far as the chronic stress goes, you know, I see room for improvement sometimes. And I also see that like, sometimes people are stretched so thin. I don't know what they're going to do to be able to reduce that load of chronic stress. What have been some helpful things that you would tell that person who hates their job, has too much stress, understands it and wants to address it, but just doesn't really know how. Well, I mean, I could get into all the practical exercises of brain retraining. There's, I mean, so many different things that you could do, right? In terms of, I mean, it could be simple. It could be doing like meditations and visualization. It could be physical exercise, doing deep breathing, stuff like that. But I really think that the the, the main thing is that people need to um, a change their perceptions of things and b you know have have something that they could get up in the morning and be excited about having passion in their lives again you know i've i've i told people at the retreat this that you know the the question i always start with people there was really two questions i always start with people first off what happened to you before you got sick and if you ask that question which of course a doctor will never ask them what happened right before you got sick it's a very simple question. Um, and uh, you really get into it. I mean, 99% of the time, there will be some sort of traumatic event or or crazy stressor or chronic stress people were dealing with right before they got sick and before the wheels fell off. Um, but, you know, I have to talk about having something to aim at, right? And I know this is going to sound very Jordan Peter Peterson-esque, um, but... If you don't have anything to aim at, then you're kind of just wandering around aimlessly in this life. And, you you know, it's really hard to derive any purpose in your life if you don't have anything to aim at. So I always say to people, what does the best version of yourself look like? And it took a lot of time for me to think on that for myself. What does the best version of myself look like? Oftentimes, people revert back to their childhood, right? That is the best version of themselves. They're living in the present moment. They're happy. They they have friends. They're living without a care in the world. But, you know, I've discovered for, for myself, and I always tell people that you have so much more than that, especially after you've gone through chronic illness like we have. You can have that imagination you as, a, as, as, a, as a child. You can have that living in the present moment. You can have that that intention of of love, you know, you don't come into this world hating things and 
you know, anger, angry, and and this and that. You're not disillusioned by the corruption of the world and so on and so forth. You live in love as a kid, you know, and those are the most amazing qualities. That that is what innocence is. But when you get older and you deal with all this shit and people let you down and people screw you over and the medical system screws you over and you get sick and you know you, you've become so disillusioned with the world um oftentimes people will let that uh, will will let that sort of abyss take them into the black hole and they get stuck there but what what you can do is you could take that and you could change your perceptions on things and you could start incorporating gratitude in your life for for having gone through these challenges and struggles in your life and um and when you do that you could derive purpose in your life from these challenges you know you could derive intention for gratitude and appreciation which you can't really do as a child you don't have intention towards gratitude and, and appreciation for life um you 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 could take that knowledge you could take everything and you could have what you had as a child so you combine all that stuff together for me that's the best version of myself and every day now i try to implement certain practices and certain behaviors and habits and patterns in my life and um, geared towards my ultimate goals. And that really, that's what changed everything for me. But I think really to, to be able to get to that place, you have to have some self-awareness, right? You have to have self-awareness as to what your identity is. Is your identity based towards somebody who is you know, living that best version of themselves, or is it geared towards someone who's living with chronic illness? Are you researching symptoms all day? Are you looking into this all day? Are you, do you have any more joy in your life? Are you lying in bed all day? You know, what are you doing? What are you doing in your daily practices? You know, are you actually working towards it? Or are you just kind of sitting there stewing with like I did for years, lying in bed, just saying, woe is me, my life sucks. You know, watching TV, that type of thing. You know, the uh, uh, the best program out there for healing is one that doesn't cost anything is and is natural. You know, people heal from all sorts of conditions before we had all this technology and, and so on and so forth. So getting back to that natural state, getting back to ancestral living, getting back to eating proper human diet, whatever that might be for you, um, are the best healers out there. And that's really what we're all about with uh, with Wired for Healing. Mm, I love that. What a lovely answer that was. As you are kind of developing this community and finding people that are interested and, and want to be healed as well, it's so important to have a good team around you of people that can that can help. And I see that when I go to your website and I see JC and some of the other people that you are working with. Tell me, tell us what it's been like to find people that can assist you in pushing this message forward and what it's like to be, to be working with them. Well, I'm I'm an open book, you know. I I don't uh, I I just sort of speak my mind, and uh, <laughs> I'm not I'm not very corporate here. So I'm just going to throw this out there that uh, Wire for Healing we're we're going through a restructuring right now where we're building out modules on our website. Unfortunately, JC has left because she's uh, she has her own group at the uh, what's it called the SERS group. Um, so she she's no longer with Wire for Healing, but she will be coming to Meat Stock and and working with Meat Stock and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, find, find the right team of people, you know, like I've, I've, I have a business in, in Toronto as well. Um, I used to have a gym that sort of morphed into, um, uh, doing like corporate training and stuff like that. And, uh, you are only as good as the, the team that you surround yourself with. So the main thing is with, with Wire for Healing and, and Meat Stock too, you know, the people who I invite to these things and the guest speakers, like I have to know who you are. I have to know that you're a good person, that you're honest you actually care about people. This is some sort of money-making gimmick for you or, or whatever, right? We're not trying to scam people here. Um, and and I, and to be honest with you, from someone who's lived with chronic illness for, for the better part of a decade, I mean, I would say that the majority of people out there are just trying to make money off of you. You know, I've, I've been cleaned out of tens of thousands of dollars in my bank account. And uh, really all it boiled down to is just dealing with my stress and doing some fasting. I mean, if I'd just known that from the beginning, I, <laughs> it would have saved me a lot of time and money. And uh, I would say that, it, you know, not not to toot my own horn, but I mean, just taking that philosophy that I've, I've worked with a lot, a lot of people now and 
it seems to be a strategy that works pretty well for people, you know, just managing your stress, dealing with certain uh, exercises in your daily life, looking at your patterns, look at your habits. You don't have to join our group. I mean, you can do that for free, but if you want motivation, you know, you can, you can join our group, but it's totally up to you. I mean, I'd tell you how you, how you can do it for free. I don't really care to, to, you know, if you don't have the money or what, whatever, like, I don't care. I'll just tell people whatever, whatever they want. Like I do all sorts of free calls with people. Um, and that's what I love about our team. Our, our team is really just geared towards helping people. It's not about trying to get memberships and, and all that. I mean, you got to make a living, but you know, I just want people who are caring people and, you know, even if they didn't know anything about brain retraining, that's something you could teach them, but you can't teach being a good person, you know? So that's the main thing that I, I care about. So we are looking for people on our team. If you're a good person and you actually want to help people, then uh, reach out and we'll see what, what we could do. And I love that. One another just really great answer. Are you still offering uh, group classes with people a few days a week? Actually, no, we're not. We're, we just, dec I decided to uh, pause that because, um, you know, we, we kind of just launched Wire Free Healing and, and it wasn't a fully, it wasn't like a, a very complete program at the time. And, and, um, if you get to know me, I'm, I'm the most imperfect, imperfect, <laughs> imperfect. Um, I'm sorry. I got no sleep last night. I'm the most imperfect perfectionist out there. Uh, I have a lot of flaws, you know, but, um, I'm not happy with the project if it's not the way I want it to look. And I didn't think it was as best as it could have been. So I decided to scrap the community classes for now until we get the member portal completely set up, which is what we're in the process of doing right now. Um, so we're getting all these modules set up and uh, getting a system in place um, so that people really could go point by point as to where to go with their healing and um, and being able to discover themselves and develop self-awareness and um, yeah, just trying to navigate living with chronic illness. So, so that's where we're starting with then. And then we're going to get back, we're going to be getting back into the community program where you're going to have that support five days a week, because it's one of those things with brain retraining, you have to make a real investment. It's not like we're not, this isn't a sexy prescription by any measure. You know, this is why I think brain retraining is so underrated because it's not a sexy prescription and it's not really a prescription that people can make money off of. It's the same as metabolic therapy for cancer, right? It's never going to be a, a mainstream um, uh, modality for, for healing from anything because people can't make money off of it, you know? So, um, so where was I going with that, man? I'm ranting a lot today. That's uh, great. Yeah. So, so it's, it, it, you know, it's one of those things where you have to make a real investment. You have to do the daily work. You know, you're not going to be able to change these, these, or, or reorganize your neural processes. If you're just doing something once a week, you have to be doing it every single day and you have to put time into it every day to develop those new neural synapses and prune away the negative ones that are not helping you towards your ultimate goal of healing. So really that's where, that's where we come in and I could tell you how to do that stuff for free, but if you need a group and you want coaching and you want to take part in, in these sort of um, daily community classes and get that support, then that's where our group might be coming handy for you. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds great. Your website is really good. I really am look, looking forward to the reiteration of it in the future. Um, there's lots of helpful tools on there that will help people. And again, I, I, the, the theme of community keeps coming up so much in this conversation. Um, and you're doing such a great job of, of spreading that around. So I really do appreciate that. And I appreciate you, Scott, for taking the time out of your busy life to come on our show today. Where can people go to find you and connect with you and your work? Yeah, you could go to wiredforhealing.com or the Wired for Healing YouTube uh, pay, uh, channel. Um, we do have meat stock uh, next year. It's uh, not for quite a while, not till September of 2025. But I will be unveiling the details of that pretty soon on the website. And I can tell you guys, if you guys thought we had a good uh, you know, guest speaker lineup for last one, you guys are going to be absolutely floored with who we have lined up for this one. So it's a very exciting... Uh, less, uh, list of guests that we have signed sign up for the next one. 
And it's going to be a really, really cool event. It's a life-changing event. So I highly su suggest you guys check it out. Um, and uh, yeah, Wired for Healing will be coming back uh, eventually in the next few months. So if you guys are interested, or if you just want to reach out to me and, and have a phone conversation, I'm happy to to talk to you and give you guys some some uh, advice. I don't do coaching one on one, but I will, um, you know, give people advice for free as best I can, as long as it's uh, within my time constraints. I do have two little kids, so I can't uh, I can't do this all day long, but I will do my best. Uh, that's incredibly kind of you to be able to offer that. And uh, yeah, I've heard I've heard word on the street in the carnivore community that next year meat stock is going to be absolutely epic. So very curious to see how that turns out. Again, Scott, what an amazing journey that you've been on and to to have the desire to go back out and share that with a community is absolutely wonderful. So thank you so very much for everything that you do and for taking time to be on our show today. I'm very, very much looking forward to meeting you in person in Austin here in a week and a half. So that would be great. But for now, thank you so very much for taking time to be on our show today. We really appreciate you. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate it. Maybe we could grab a steak in Austin. That sounds epic. Let's do it. That sounds great. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.